Welcome to Three Songs. I'm uh, professional film critic Sean Patrick. With me is a professional musician, Brad Rogers, and his beautiful wife, music fan Faith. And uh, each week we talk about three songs. We each pick a song and then we spend time talking about it and see where the conversation takes us. Another week of three very unique and different songs with uh, unique and different mindsets. We'll start with mine this week because I'm really eager to talk about this one since I've only heard it like three times total. Uh, It's Ed Sheeran's new single called Perfect. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's just the mood I'm in lately, but uh, this song just... I I find this song to be emblematic of a generation that doesn't have any music. Um, This generation, I feel so bad for them. When you look at the the biggest stars that they have, Ed Sheeran and Taylor Swift, putting out some of the worst music of their careers. I mean, not the one. Shape of Me is not a bad song, Ed Sheeran's song. It's catchy. It's catchy as hell. Uh, Castle on the Hill at least showed some potential for what he can do. But this song has nothing. There's nothing to this. Lyrically especially, Faith, there's nothing to this. This is just filled with uh, cliches. Just endless numbers of cliches. I didn't care much for it myself. Um, I found it a little reminiscent of... um, and Now I can't remember the name. The song where he talks about when my legs don't work the way they used to, which I really enjoy. Yeah. I really enjoy that song. I think mm-hmm. lyrically it's it's special. I think musically it's it's special. Um, but that it touches a personal note with me. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> it would have been better as a walk to actually do that three four times. So, All right, boss camps. Yeah. <laughs> he says maybe I'm dancing in the dark with you between my arms. He says that a lot in the song. But he also talks about dancing in this other song, like, yeah. which is m- far superior to perfect. Oh, yeah. I mean, because this song is just so empty. I mean, I-, I found a love for me. Darling, just dive right in and follow my lead. Well, I found a girl beautiful and sweet. Oh, I never knew you were someone. You were the someone waiting for me. Like, first of all, just the, the chauvinism of all these lyrics bothers me, too. I mean, she has no part of this. It's his love. He owns her heart where she just holds his. I mean, it's a it's a chauvinistic song on top of being an, a, a song without any original ideas to it. She even talks about her heart being all that he owns. Yes, which he owns, but that's the point, though. He owns it where she just holds his. Mm-hmm. Issues. <laughs> His or mine? <laughs> Could be a little bit of both. <laughs> Mostly his, though. Brad, you found something different about this song. You were talking about the timing. It, it, yeah, it would be better if he done it as a waltz. Yeah. And kind of brought in, actually, if he would have used an accordion, it would have been perfect for a, a little background beginnings and giving it a whole different texture of the song. The, the problem with the song is it's naked. It's just core. Gorgeous. I mean, as far as the melodic and the, the chord structure goes, but as you said, Faith, it's kind of like hearing the same thing over and over and over. He does if you use that scale a lot, that chromatic, you know, drop down on just his third. But so is heart and soul. <laughs> well, you know, so is uh, Johnny Be Good and uh, Good Night Sweetheart. They're all based off of that whole step down chromatic scale. And anybody can sing in that. But what I thought was interesting was he kept trying to make it a, a schmaltzy, slow song, but it didn't fit because there's too much rhythm going on for what it should have been. Does that make sense? Like, he, it was a naked song. But they use the whole wrong rhythm. It's more far. It, 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 I wonder if they maybe tried to slow it down to match the lyrics that he was coming up with. These empty, cliched lyrics of his. I would imagine that the song was actually probably a little more up tempo because it's got some pr- fairly strong rhythm in it, and it should have nice brushes, you know, and delicate See, touch. He seems to be trying to t- trying to make something along the lines of uh, "Wonderful Tonight." Uh, Eric Clapton's song, but that song, I mean, that song is rich. It's filled with bitterness and sarcasm. That, All kinds of things. I mean, people are talking about that song today as being a wedding song, but they're not actually paying attention to it, you know? <laughs> what's really cool about that, about that song you're saying, Eric Clapton was brilliant. He took a blues song 
and he took a popular contemporary love song and he put him into the two things. Now, what do blues talk about generally? How you lost your woman, how you got no job, and you just blah, blah, blah. Then you put it over how I love my life and my woman, she's so beautiful tonight. Well, was she not beautiful the night before? I mean, <laughs> I mean, something changed? Well, she put on the dress. Well, she puts a blue dress on. Well, wow, that's a whole different ball game. She uh, wears a white dress. She's ugly again. What, what, what? But the reason why I laughed about that song is because in, in the same song, he's, he's an endless loop. It, it's like the endless loop never ends. It's the same thing over again, the same henceforth uh, idea, and it never changes. It never grows. It doesn't have a climax. It doesn't have, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This song is just so empty lyrically. I mean, like I said about a Clapton before, the you know the music is wonderful, but there's also that that touch of sarcasm and bitterness that is just makes it so much more beautiful in its way. Whereas this, he's talking about, you know, she's talking about uh, not looking her best that day, and he says, "No, uh, you're." He's telling her how beautiful she is, and he kind of, and it's like he means it, and I get like the sincerity. I understand being sincere, but. That's not really much fun for a song, is it? <laughs> Don't you have anything a little bit more complex than this? Which, well, I mean, again, him being emblematic of what a, a rock star is today really bothers me. This is the kind of emptiness that kids are being exposed to constantly. He even says, going back to the comparison um, for Wonderful Tonight, he repeats, you look perfect tonight. Yeah. But the, going back to the lyrics... It, as far as everything is his, 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 his. Yep. You know, he's, and this, I, I don't know if it's, I, I wouldn't consider myself necessarily a feminist. Like, I'm not, you know, I, I love cooking dinner for my husband and for my family and, you know, not so much doing the laundry. That would be a lie, but <laughs> he says, I found a love to carry more than just my secrets, to carry love, to carry children of our own. Does she get to a part in that? Or? <laughs> it just, it offends me. And it sounds so much like so many of his other songs as far as music. And I, I enjoy it, you know. Everybody knows that I love the lyrics, but I enjoy the music too. If I don't enjoy the music, then I'm not very much going to be able to get that far into the lyrics unless I'm, you know, reading them as a separate entity and then putting them back together. Right. But I'm going to say this. He reminds me of Adele in that every song seems to sound the same. Different words, different lyrics, same song. I don't appreciate that. And, and then especially when you look at the lyrics, they're a little bit offensive. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I also have to take, you know, this is probably going to be nitpicking, but the way he says grass bothers me. <laughs> it sounded like the first time I heard it, I was like, did he just say bare feet on the cross? Is this somehow some kind of Jesus thing? Then I'm looking at the lyrics and go, no, it's grass. And that makes grass. more sense in the... In it's the become grass. It's British. But it sounds like he's saying cross, and it irritates me. <laughs> well... <laughs> By all means, then. I, it's a little thing, but it bothered me. But this whole song bothers me, really, I guess, when I get down to it. I just don't think this is... Oh, this is if this is what people are, are listening to the most, that that's really sad. Not that I had anything great when I was a kid, but at least you know there was some complexity to run DMC. I listened to that. <laughs> the Beastie Boys, they had a, a certain humor run and sarcasm. DMC was so basic, that's what made them so good. Beastie Boys I'm saying, anyway. but there was a lot more lyrically to what the run DMC do, what did than what these guys did. <laughs> well, I agree with you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but I was laughing because I thought that was funny. That. <laughs> that's what I listened to, but I I also, you know, I, I, I also listened to Bon Jovi. There wasn't much to Bon Jovi, much more than this, I would say. I listened to Def Leppard. I mean, yeah, yeah. Def Leppard when they tried to go, when yeah. they try and write great lyrics, they... had the cassette. More <laughs> it does sound a little bit funny when they tried to write something more complex. <laughs> 
personally, I was in love with the grunge. Yeah. You know, that was all. I even wore the flannel plaid shirts. Like, I was in love with grunge. But lyrically... Much stronger. Amazing. Yeah. Some of these songs that Pearl Jam and Nirvana, they wrote, were like... Some type of pilots. Right? <laughs> I, I mean, we could go Lush. on. Yeah. It, it, they, it, they were genius and the music behind that just fueled it it just made it even better and you're right this is the difference is sometimes when i believe now now i may be wrong but does ed sheeran use a songwriter to come up with these or does he write he is listed i believe he's listed as the songwriter on this uh okay who's the song producer on this I that I don't know. Perfect lyrics. Okay. Or how was he was the writer. Who, writer Ed so who was the who who played it? Who was the backup band? Did it say? I don't know, but I don't know. Sometimes it'll give the band, and, and sometimes they're you know Aerosmith or somebody you recognize, <laughs> you know, crazy enough. But sometimes it's just a no name. But what I'm after is that did he really put this together, or was it thrown together for? Him? Well, it charted at number four in the UK um, prior to release. Ha uh ha, -huh. funny. <laughs> um, it was written about his girlfriend, Cherry Seaborn, <laughs> which again, I feel bad for her if this is the depth of his feelings that he could come up with. <laughs> Sorry, but... He says the inspiration set came from just from James Blunt's house. <laughs> uh, it's explained. Uh, the conundrum. Here we go. In an interview with Zane Lowe, he said, "I just wanted to beat thinking out loud," which is a lyrically not the same but similar. He uses yes. a lot of the same. Uh, imagery in thinking out loud which is the the one that I was referencing earlier because I know that song was going to define me with perfect it was like I need to write the best love, love song of my career well I mean he, um, at the very least he'll write a successful song uh, the, so the song is successful and it's going to be played at weddings for years by people who don't bother to listen to lyrics well he said <laughs> yeah he, he did say it's uh, the BBC actually said it's guaranteed to soundtrack thousands of first dances before the year's out. <laughs> that reminds me of everything I do, I do it for you. Oh, God. What Come a on now. piece of crap that right? was. I always but love it, you. How it was many how many dances you? did people go to, and that was the song <laughs> that was like, to be honest. And the rose. Oh, God, please stop. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> Old enough to know that that was a wedding that you had to play <laughs> as a DJ, and you went, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. I, I, was, press play. I was some. I was a 90s kid, and yet somehow at my at my prom, we, our song was uh, Take It on the Run by Ario Speedwagon. Like, how the hell did that happen? That's like... <laughs> Ten I years ago. <laughs> Sophia's age at the roller rink with my mom. That was seriously like younger than Sophia. Like, at the didn't make any sense. It's nineteen ninety four. What are we doing? <laughs> at least you didn't have I believe I can fly. Oh god. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sophia will start singing that and Circle like, of Life. <laughs> That's what I had. We sang that for graduation. I really, I didn't sing. I mouthed the whole thing. I didn't actually sing. That's, a, that's the truth. I'm sorry, Ronald May. I, I lied. I did not sing. So, oddly enough, yeah, it topped Billboard charts at number four in the UK. In the US, it was number 37. Still rising. Still rising. So it just came out, yeah, like last week. It's when we started playing it on my radio station. Woo! That's rough. And that is what our children 
this and Taylor right now. Yeah. I mean, that's what they're... And Taylor's news not... That's what they're no, buying. We discussed that one already. I'll yeah. just stop right there. Thank you. I was dead. <laughs> it started playing on my YouTube. Like, it was my mix. It started playing on my YouTube, and it probably because we listened to and it a couple times. Sophia was like, no, I'm not turning that off. And we're like, no, please. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Faith, let's make you happy and talk about your song. Yay! Uh, my song is Be Okay by Ingrid Michaelson. 2008. I am a fan. Um, she's very... She's not mainstream. She's not super popular. Um, but I started listening to her several years ago. Um and have enjoyed her both musically and lyrically ever since then. Um, so this song just kind of resonates with me, especially right now um, in my life. You know, stuff goes on, and music has always been a way for me to feel better, to express my emotions. And I just love, you know, the, the beginning is a, a little repetitive yeah. um, I just want to be okay you know she sings that for a while but and she says open me up and you will see I'm a gallery of broken hearts I'm beyond repair let me be and give me back my broken heart like it's just poetry the way yeah. that she writes it's just absolutely beautiful poetry you could take it to a spoken word or an open mic night and just speak the lyrics and, and they would do fine outside of the music. But then the fact that she puts it to a catchy, you know. Very, yeah, like poppy beat. Is amazing. I, I love it. I, I just, I just love it. I could have, knowing you as well as I do, I could imagine this as the thing that's constantly running through your head all day. <laughs> Some days more than others, absolutely. <laughs> It, it speaks to me on a very personal, vulnerable level. Um, you know, when I was divorcing from my first marriage, it was something that um, actually, it, and my aunt was dying. It was a song that we drove to Colorado to see her before. Um, they didn't give her much time. So we drove to Colorado to see her, and this was a song that was constantly coming up on my playlist as something, you know, and it just inspired and motivated me, which I think is what music should do. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, that's kind of the difference between what we were talking about before, kids listening to... Nothing about that will be inspiring. Right. Or even memorable. At all. And then something like this, you know, it's, it's a lot of... This song is a lot of repetition, granted. But... When you get into the meat of it, I just want to feel today. I just want to feel something today. You know, it just, it hits me in a spot that's deep <laughs> <laughs> for me. Brad, what did you think of the music? Hmm. It's very pleasing. Um, I like the transition to a chromatic step down into a diminished step down when it she goes into the refrain and in my head even though I know it's your voice I hear brass going off because it's so powerful it's so like sweeping and then it comes back to oh I just want to be okay and it's so rhythmic the way she's doing her versing, that it actually becomes the rhythm. You don't hear the rhythm anymore. It kind of disappears. Then it comes back in that part, and then it disappears. So whenever she's doing her verses, that's when it's rhythmic. And it's done, and that was precise wording. There was no other doubt about that. That was practiced a thousand times. And this was a, I mean, it's a two minute and 27 second song. Mm -hmm. That packs a lot of punch. And I'm sure it was hard for her to do it at the end. I'd be like, <sighs> But that's brilliant what you yeah. said, because I can hear that now that he said that. I can hear the 
how she carries when she's actually talking about not that it's not all content to me but when she's actually changing the lyrics and telling the story i can hear that difference now that he points it out of how it goes from this hoppy Hop, happy choppy, choppy to this very free flowing but then becomes diminished it's almost it's almost minor it almost gives you this sense of darkness and mysteriousness but and it, then it relaxes back into major so that's where you feel that but I think that's the I just point wanna, of And then the you're fine. But that's yeah. why they're doing it. It's compare and contrast. The point. The yeah, point is that... It was brilliantly done. That's what I was trying to say. These lyrics are heartbreaking. If you really listen to them, they are heartbreaking. But they are also extremely uplifting. Like, you can... And if you go you through... You can be okay. If you go through... and. Then, this is just a hypothetical. If you go through a breakup, you have those moments of manic swings, you know, where you're okay and then you're not okay. And then you're okay and then you're not okay. You know what I'm saying? And, and a breakup can be anything. It can be the death of a family member. It can be the, a divorce. It can be... I'm just saying. This song just happened to come along at that time where I was going through both of those things. So it was like an anthem for me. I would listen to it and look myself in the mirror, look at myself in the mirror and be like, I just want to be okay, you know. And recently times have gotten a little harder emotionally and, you know, this song just reminds me that, you know, I can, you know, as, it, as soon as you were like, what song? And I'm, I'm like, okay, this is resonating with me again right now. So, it means a lot. That's, what's all, that's what music should be. That's what I feel movies should be. I keep trying to explain that to people, like people who argue with me on Twitter about movies. I'm like, movies should matter. You know, the emoji movie is not a movie. It's not. It doesn't elicit any kind of emotional. I mean, other than the poop emoji, I love that guy. Like that guy cracks me up. Is it emotive at all? No, I mean it's really not. It's just it's a product. The whole point of emoticon is an icon <laughs> with emotion. <laughs> Stand in for so emotions. you're trying the to emotions see. that you don't have. But you, you know, you, you don't want to type out or go through all the process, so you use the picture. That's get, a, a, get, the, Ed, Ed Sheeran's perfect could be a an emoticon. It really uh, could, Ed or emoji. Be on the emoto movie or whatever that is. <laughs> it should be the soundtrack to that. I once sent it's, Aiden like twenty different emoticons, and I'm like, ah, I'm the emoto mom. <laughs> Oh, that is such a mom joke. Right? <laughs> he thought so, too. I thought I was freaking hilarious. I worry that, like, the language is going to, going to become so diminished in, in the future that it's going to it's gonna be like that, like, Judge movie. It's going to be like uh, the one where everybody's really, really stupid and can't talk anymore. Idiocracy. <laughs> because people just don't know. I mean, I, I just don't even have to talk. I don't, you don't even have to order a pizza anymore. You just pizza emoji to Domino's, and they bring you a pizza twenty minutes later. <laughs> it's, it's true. True. It's true. You can order pizza by by emoji now. My mind just got blown. Okay, way off. <laughs> way off the rails. So let's bring it back. So... Do they have different flavor emojis? <laughs> Because I yeah, of course. stuck with the same so you, thing every time. You can well, get you, sausage, like, pepperoni. Yeah, you okay. kind of program. I'm jumping in the rabbit hole. Go right. Ahead, go <laughs> so that goes back to your song then. Yeah. yeah. In the whole being language, language being, for me, in this song, well, look, I, I, simple. Yeah. Very simple. But it's full of this profound emotion and feeling whereas your song is got a lot of words yeah a lot of words a lot of empty meaningless words right a lot, <laughs> a lot of, of very emojis. surface level emotion a lot of very surface level emotion that are very easy set easily said and it wasn't even oh, it, we were uh, talking about my song yes. now. <laughs> I'm sure now. I, I to be fair to the to the younger listeners, I'm sure there's there are artists out there that are doing things. Just nobody's listening to them. Everybody's all the ever. Most of the people are listening to this guy, and he's not delivering. And he's supposed to be the biggest star in the world right now. 
That's just a, my radar. Well, you know, though, I have listened to, because I have a 14-year-old child, I have listened to some of the music that he listens to, and some of it, you know, he's much like I was at his age in that he finds different music, finds music that is not Tay-Tay or Ed Sheeran or... He, he finds just alternative, what was called alternative when I was his age. He, that's what he finds, and that's what I... I began listening to Nirvana at 14, which was, you know, not something a 14-year-old listened to. Um, yeah, because you had to be 16 to be able to buy that. Well, that good. was one thing that my mom was super cool about, you know. <laughs> she was like, you want to listen? Listen, dude, do you want to... Have purple hair? Have purple hair. Just follow the rules. <laughs> <laughs> so I started listening to that music, that type of music, the alternative type of music, and I've heard some of these artists that Aiden listens to, um, you know, and I'm going to go back to 21 Pilots. I'm going to talk about Panic at the Disco. I'm going to, they are brilliant. Brilliant. You know, he loves Kendrick Lamar. Lyrically, take the music aside, because I can't, it just doesn't, you know, I'm that old person now that <laughs> rap just doesn't always go well with. Yeah, never went well. Lyrically, it's beautiful. If you read Kendrick Lamar's lyrics, it's like, he should have been a poet. So there is music out there that's profound, but it's not being listened to. Speaking of profound music, I'm sure there are times when uh, when Jethro Tull produced such things. <laughs> oh, this, was, oh this, this song was picked on purpose. Oh, now we're gonna fight. <laughs> this song was picked on purpose just to get underneath your skin. Oh, I, won't I don't know that it gets Gentlemen. under my skin. I don't oh, like. I don't we like had the a flute. Lengthy conversation that was I'm not a fan the of the flute. So now we're on the record, and we're going to talk about the flute because it does a whole different thing. It really thing. does a lot in this song, which didn't do a lot for me. Although I did like this when I was a kid, but I was a big, a big. I thought being, I thought being cool was being into old music. Do you know why I thought you would like just a little bit of it? Thunder and bass line. The bass line. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> it didn't even really stand out. In the, oh in the my god! Kid. <laughs> oh. I was Sorry. focusing. My brain. I had to reset that. I kept trying to uh, trying to come come around on the lyrics and try and pick up the story. Okay, what you got of the story? Because I actually got a whole different version of what you guys think. <laughs> well, this is a song about death. Could be. Uh, that's why I read it. I read it as being about death because in the final in the final uh, part of the song, he's talking about. Uh, Picking up Gideon's Bible at page one, I thank God he stole the handle of the train. It won't stop going the way to slow down. He's talking about catching angels as they fall. Um, I mean, he's talking about the silence howling. I mean, he's talking about death. He's talk he knows he's going to die, and he's accepting it. And see, I hear a man who was a very hard worker who got into a bad situation, who got cheated on and disrought and put out to the pasture way too early and all he has left is his identity and now his identity is nothing more than a broken ass train that's hauling ass downhill and can't stop. So he knows that there's going to be an end and the end's going to be very clear when it stops because he, he can't stop. <laughs> he can't stop. It's a song about death. But I think it's a song about, you know, the inevitable life choice of being with a sucky partner and how you feel at that point. You feel dead. You feel empty. You feel silenced because you're alone, you know. And, and But it's not what you anticipated because you got cheated on. You got done, did wrong, you know. And you still carried on. You still kept trucking down the hill, you know. And, you know I, I, I see a different thing, but I see that thing because the music actually outlines... This could be the best example I've ever had with when the music outlines a story from a beginning to a middle to an end. There is a crescendo, there is a moment of free thought and free will, and it comes back and it comes into the ending and then done. 
So it's it's a very from the beginning being so beautiful with a symphonic orchestration, if you will, and then comes into a jazz orchestration, and then goes into a full rock balls to the wall. Let's nail this down. You know when that drum comes in, the, the guitar. Da, 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 that is the most powerful feeling, and when you get the piano and you're you playing that 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 rhythm that you're doing is actually a train, because mm -hmm. you're the train, you're the whole point of what they're doing, and then when he comes in with the flute, that's the whistle, that's the whistle where he's he's happy and he's joyless, and and he doesn't just play the flute, he voices through the flute. <laughs> through the flute. Right, no, I, I, I get what you're saying with the train thing, but I think I think both Blackfoot and Aerosmith did it better on their train songs. Mm, I don't know. I think he was the pilgrim. I think he was the first one there. Now I have an entirely different interpretation of the lyrics, Please. which I find odd. Um, not odd, just odd that the three of yeah. In the first chorus or the first part of the song he says in the shuffling madness of the locomotive breath runs the all time loser okay and then he starts talking um about the train he's talking about the train and how it's kind of going out of control Charlie stole the handle right but then he says no way to slow down he sees his children jumping off at stations one by one. His woman and his best friend. Okay, so I can see where you get the cheating part. What I'm seeing is he they they use the word loser. Okay. And this is probably going to uh, offend many people's sensibility, but I see that maybe this is a, a man, a homeless man hopping trains who has mm. no home who's lost his family Very who's lost point. his life who's who has nothing left to live for and he's not going to die unfortunately but maybe he wants to you know it, you keep going down you've seen Jeff Loto you would think that he jumped right off <laughs> he's a homeless man jumping I, swear. Well, I mean the picture no I on swear the, on the record cover you know it, it, to me that's what the lyrics are like not that Brilliant. I'm comparing homeless people to losers but the, just the imagery to me it's like i can imagine i've been in a place where i had nothing and i felt like a loser you know so you know i maybe when i first learned the song was when my first girlfriend when i was 19 years old broke up with me and I was a shattered effing mess. <laughs> I mean, a mess. You know, the first one, you know, everything, the first, the first, the first. And she done did me wrong with her, one of my friends, right? And thank Jesus that I had this song to carry me through, because that's what I, that was my imagery of pounding up my friend. I, sometimes I think I was going to break that. I mean, just, just right through the floor. But, She's crazy now, so we're good. <laughs> I'm glad I had this song. You seem to attract crazy women. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but on the flip side, most musicians are. So. If this guy is the all-time loser, who's this all-time winner he's talking about? I think it's well, different. God. God? Because look, he says the all-time winner has got him by the balls, and he picks up Gideon's Bible, which is just a Bible. You know, right. that the Gideons put in the hotel room. Or yeah. In the, you know. It's only in hotel rooms. He picks up Gideon's Bible, open at page one. So maybe he's... Finding religion? Or finding hope. You know, I, I have a different opinion on spirituality and religion than most people do. I, I feel. Um, and I think that that part there symbolizes hope. But, again, then he goes on. I think God, he, with a capital H, stole the handle. 
Well, interesting point. Uh, Ian Anderson says, Old Charlie, who appears in the chorus of this song, represents God. See, and I didn't even do my <laughs> research. Uh, Anderson says that when he stole the handle, he left the train running out of control. This symbolized everyone facing injustice in life and feeling powerless to do anything about it. And you just have to make the best of it. Which, you know, can apply to anyone nowadays. We yeah. all have our own situations if in Anybody life. can play the flute with that solo. They can, they can step right on the line. I will follow you. <laughs> And I will praise you. <laughs> you can be God. <laughs> I'll even give you tithe. <laughs> but you got to be that good. 10%. If you're less than that, you're going bother. Here's what he said about the music, Brad. And you can you ever see it? You ever hear a cover remake of this one, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> he says it took a few attempts to record this song because he had to impress upon the band that musically it was supposed to feel like a train on the tracks not one that goes off and explodes he used the analogy of a boiler building up pressure to describe the song musically restraining the drummer is always a challenge when performing this song you know that's hilarious because every time I play this song live with anything it doesn't matter the drummer always you have to tell it okay so like it's like a rhythm, and you have to play off of me because when I'm trained, it kind of goes, shoot, dun, 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 dun. you know, it's it's rhythmic, you know, and he, and they're uh, they're like looking at you like you're crazy, but they always play this like, you know, the snare and the tom at the same time and they're alternating, and it's like no no no, you know, it's the whole point, <laughs> but every time there's a because anytime you come out of that melodic, you know, that symphony part of the... They're like, so when do we come in? <laughs> <laughs> After we're done. I don't know. How hard is that? <laughs> but rhythmically is challenging because it's completely syncopated. Every other instrument is off of the, the rhythm. They're not on the rhythm. They're playing off the rhythm. And that's why drummers have issues because they're usually on the rhythm. Anything to add, Faith? Musically? I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Not a fan of the flute? Uh, no, the flute doesn't bother me. Um, I think the flute player in the band is... The lead Not singer. just in this song. Right, but in all of their music is extremely talented. Doesn't bother me, doesn't put me off. For some reason, the music to this song just doesn't catch me it doesn't right. pull me in i i mean he's an exceptionally talented flute player yeah <laughs> so there's no doubt about that and you know i've tried to play the flute Not a i can only play it on piano my kid plays the flute he's not bad at it it's not an easy instrument to play and i've played a couple so but musically, I'm just not. I can't. I just can't get over having seen it in Anchorman and how silly people look when they're trying to play it like a badass. <laughs> it's hard to play the flute like a badass. Jeff Rowe. Yeah. It's a true statement. <laughs> Who does that? That's Who does true. that? At least they do it, you know? That's the, that is something I can it's, give them. Like, at least that's different. There's nobody playing a flute in a song today, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> or, or, or a soprano sax for that. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, Kenny, I had to do it. <laughs> so, the one thing, the reason why that flute part stands out with me most is because it's like taking uh, an overdrive on a guitar or on an organ. It really gives it a dirty like a feel of grit and iron and crack coming at you. So you hear this flute and you hear that all of a sudden you hear this whoop and you're like, well, what's that? <laughs> that wasn't a flute. <laughs> what was that? You know, and when you hear it and With see it, when you hear it and see it live, it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, that's a neat idea, you know, because it gave it a texture versus just this one image, you know. I think they did that better for me anyway on Bungle in the Jungle. I think that's a better idea of what of what uh, Jethro Tull does for me. 
Emblematic oh, gives. That is a great song. <laughs> I was quietly singing it to myself. The the uh, use the use of animal noises. I it's love fantastic. My favorite Jethro Tull song is one that probably well I know you've heard it because I've played it a bazillion times, but most people haven't heard of is "Wondering Out Loud." Lyrically, it's it magical. is beautiful. He talks about. How oh, she she can eat toast in his bed and he doesn't even care if they're crumbs. Like and I don't and that's know. That's a big thing because you know how bad crumbs hurt when you're sleeping. I know. <clears throat> they're like thorns in the bed. You don't do it. Or this is my my mother's favorite metaphor about men she likes. He could eat crackers in my bed. <laughs> right. So but there's no flute. I'm gonna use that the rest of my life. <laughs> It's it's coined. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to say uh, uh, note one in a song. The other the other one she liked to use was uh, just because I'm on a diet doesn't mean I can't look at the menu. I'm <laughs> looking. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to use that the next time she looks at a man. <laughs> what, Brad? I'm on a diet. <laughs> Isn't he a big dish of ice cream? What did I say today? Man, his boobies just don't quit. <laughs> he did. There was... Totally awesome. It looked like the whole thing at me. There was a guy walking down our road. And... Bigger than mine. <laughs> bigger, 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 bigger. Like, bigger. So he's like, man, his boobies just don't quit. And like, Muscle guy? Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah <laughs> My husband just said boobies talking about a man. I was strangely, like, attracted just to look at him. Like, That's amazing how much muscle you, you have in there. Out, right? <laughs> oh, no. 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 And back to the music, kids. Every Radical. man has their gay moment. <laughs> it wasn't a gay moment. Mine was, I was uh, appreciative. Mine, mine was, was at an REM concert where I thought Michael Michael Stipe was looking right at me. He was. <laughs> it he felt was. like it. <laughs> he was looking at you and him and him <laughs> and you again. <laughs> He's a commanding gaze. Yes, they do it. All right, anybody discover anything this week? I have not, actually. Nothing that I haven't already known. I know, I've already picked out my next song. It's another one I haven't heard before. You, you I know. gonna wait till the last minute to listen to it? I totally am. Well, I'm going to hear it all week because we just added it on my radio station. Oh, you too has a new song out. And oh. I haven't heard... I haven't actually heard it yet. I just we just put it in rotation just because it's U two. It's a long time <laughs> since they had something new though. Yeah, so I'm I'm interested to take a listen to that and see what it's like. Hopefully it's good. I do enjoy some U two. I always have. You know, Bono at least always finds something to write about. You know, he, he make it socially relevant or something. <laughs> As a, whereas other artists, you know, as they get older they, they forget how to write songs and <laughs> just how to relate to normal human beings. Bono at least tries to at least find empathy, I think, in his music. Whereas most artists just find bombast as they get older. Not that they haven't, you two. They've I gone that in they that direction as well. They repeat themselves. They find a hit in me. Yeah, try and know. recreate it. Yeah, over and over and over, and it's not always... That's the, like, the influence of industry and producers, I think. Just let's get the next hit. Find the next hit. You guys can do what you want in a couple songs. We want to find the next hit. Right. That is the worst possible thing in music. I think that's what Ed Sheeran is writing to right now, is just find the next hit. That's what I'm saying. It sounds like he might be being rushed for production. Well, you 2 hasn't put out a record in... They haven't been touring even. Well, they don't have any pressure anymore. Right. <laughs> you, once, once you have a that billion dollars... God. Once you have a billion dollars, there's no pressure anymore. Nobody gets to tell you what to do now. You'd be kissing. That's, fairy like That's true. Which fairy are we going to play this month, Gary? <laughs> what type of food favorite? would you compare Bono to? <laughs> Pepperoni. I was going to say... No, I was going to say cottage pie. 
<laughs> you find him more attractive than she does. There's layer. Oh, no, cottage pie is not attractive when you make it all up. <laughs> it's not attractive. But it's yummy. It sounds good. It tastes good. It does not sound It sounds like it has a lot of calories. Bono sounds good. I like it. Oh, yeah. You can have your moment with him anytime. <laughs> I'm sure. But he doesn't look all that attractive. No. I think it sounds okay. He's, he's looking ever more like just Robin sing. Williams these days. Just sing to me while you do it, and we'll be good. It's weird. Have you seen him lately? He looks like he's morphing into Robin Williams. Oh. So he's getting short, Jewish, and fat? <laughs> For his sake, I hope. Just I his love face. Robin Williams. Just I his face. Is... I hope that he does with, you know, yeah. everything else but that. Yeah, that's true. Well, that was a downer ending. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Welcome to the jungle. <laughs> That's my next one. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Welcome to the jungle. We got fun and games.